Okay, then we continue a bit, a bit delayed as usual. Uh, so, in this diamond model, the transport infrastructure uh, may then facilitate the labor market, the workings of the of the uh, of the func functionality in the labor market. And we, and this is for for the transportation course. Uh, we have discussed. Uh, wider economic impacts, uh, the mobility of the labor force, which is uh, at work here as well. Um, <coughs> easy contacts between firms in the industry cluster, discussed that a bit towards the end of last, uh, last session. But we have no robust evidence as to how improved transport infrastructure affects industry clusters as such. Because the research has been more directed towards urban areas. How transport infrastructure improvements can affect uh, the benefits in urban areas. And uh, you may have industry clusters in, in an urban area as well, of course, but uh, the ones that I have been talking about up to now has been, let's say, in more remote regions like this one. And you find such clusters uh, in, in many places where there are, it's not a condition that it needs to be located in an urban area. Uh, the influence of, of clusters in the, in the nature of local competition, then. Uh, then we can <coughs> talk about operational effectiveness, which is, uh, let's say, the internal efficiency in the companies. That you, you have then this, this proximity, these learning effects, causes then rapid dissemination of best practices. We don't want to perform worse <coughs> than your neighbors. And uh, this, this combination of companies who are partly competitors, partly collaborators, and the opportunity by means of economic resources and human resources to do research and development activities can contribute to a let's say, a continuous improvement in this, uh, in this uh, area. Clusters, they, <coughs> they uh, can also, or they do in most cases, and that is actually one important characteristic of, of a cluster, that they are, they are more, they are competing more on, uh, on, on a, what you might call a strategic level by com competing on variants of products rather than Im engaging in, uh, in imitation and price cutting. So <coughs> uh, they try to, and that is based on this, uh, this monopolistic competition variants of the same product that they are not engaging in, uh, in this type of imitation, but more on, uh, on uh, trying to develop different products. So, uh, and this is, let's say, a description of the ideal situation. But in many regions, as we shall see also in some examples of, in not only in Norway, but in other countries, it actually works this way. You can s find traces of this, uh, this way of, uh, of, of thinking in, uh, in, in many places around the globe. The story about the emergence of this local electromechanical cluster, the history of that is very interesting because it's, it can be traced back to one single person that uh, worked in the beginning of the 19th century out on one of the islands. He ran a, a mechanical 
industry there, a small company, which is actually still, still existing, nearly or more than 100 years after it was, uh, was founded. And this person, <coughs> he was called Nils Finnøy. He had the, uh, he had an, uh, the, his principle was that he should employ young people, skilled mechanics. And when they have worked uh, in his company for, let's say, some years, perhaps up to five years, he told them to leave. Not because they were uh, not doing their job properly, because he said that, I will support you, but you should start your own industry, your own company. So um, the company that was the predecessor of uh, National Oil Well, company downtown here, uh, has their roots back to this person. The, the, the Brunvoll industry, which uh, manufactures uh, thrusters, propellers and so on, is likewise, can be rooted back to this person, that company. Uh, and there are also several uh, companies uh, <coughs> further southbound in the Olsen area, which has their roots, roots based on one of the young mechanics that was kicked out of Finnoy's company and asked to start their own business. But they did different things, and, uh, and, um, but were trained, sort of, to, to cooperate. So there has been a very strong collaboration between uh, many of these companies uh, as the years has, uh, has gone by. And a cluster like this, it takes time to establish them. So if you, uh, you can listen to, uh, to political discussions where they say that, well, we should establish a cluster. And uh, then you can say, well, that's, that's good and please be my guest, but it takes quite a lot of time if you should fulfill the conditions of a real cluster, namely supplying industries, demanding customers, uh, producers of end, end user products <coughs> and all the things that needs to to, to a company like uh, public institutions and everything. It takes, takes a lot of time. And uh, confidence building. So now I will, now we have sort of discussed the, let's say the more structural things connected to clusters, a bit on how transport can affect the workings of the clusters particularly in terms of labor market effects. Uh, we have defined what the cluster is, and we have tried, I tried to describe how they work. Now I will turn to a bit more towards microeconomics. Uh, but before I do that, a few words about local <coughs> localization. Because if you have high barriers to trade. And that may be uh, between regions, maybe between countries. Uh, and um, that has, of course, to, of course, to do with transport systems and uh, customs barriers and so on. But such barriers may cause localization of several and smaller clusters, because they are focusing on, uh, on uh, on being closer to the markets which they can serve without suffering from, uh, from high transport costs and customs and so on. And this is the idea behind, the, let's say, the internal market in the, in the EU, that one should reduce barriers to trade and perhaps then give, give rise to fewer but larger clusters. And then the advantages of geographical concentration may outweigh the benefits of proximity to the markets. Because when you reduce what I call barriers to trade, you can translate that to reduce transport costs and uh, other, other friction in the physical movement of goods and people. It's, it's easier to, to, to concentrate and you can perhaps exploit more of the economies of scale in 
in having larger production units. And you don't need to, uh, to be so worried about, uh, about high transport costs. So we may have a situation which uh, looks something like this. <coughs> Norway is not included on this map. Then we will have a cluster up here. Uh, but <coughs> the traditional picture has been a quite dispersed picture, which may become more concentrated to fewer and larger units. But there is another feature also which should be taken into consideration when we talk about concentration. And that has to do with when things get bigger, it's much more difficult to keep up the culture and the personal relationships, which is, uh, let's say, the backbone of Michael Porter's theory. Confidence building, you know people, you can work informally and so on. But you will, it is highly likely that the concentration will give you a higher number of patents. So Cambridge University will probably conclude that bigger cluster is, uh, and more concentration is good. But I'm not too sure about it when it comes to, to productivity. That is, not, that, is a, uh, that is an open question. So <coughs> we can have some main categories of clusters where you have uh, clusters near the sources of supply or, the near, or near the end user markets based on uh, Weberian optimization distances, uh, which are kind of the, let's say, the everyday term cluster when you observe uh, a lot of activity in the same place, but without being what I will call uh, and what Porter is, is calling a real cluster, because then you are more here, where you have these uh, <coughs> linkages causing external effects and uh, higher productivity. And I just referred to what we uh, discussed last time from new economic geography, the linkages upstream and downstream and technical and pecuniary effects. And uh, for those of you who are interested in new economic geography who were not here last time can, can read some of, the, uh, some of the articles in the, in the paper collection. Those of you who come from log 7.15. So, <coughs> where to get sustainable clusters in the sense that I am, have been talking about? Uh, we have localization based on historical coincidences. That may be, as I have described, one person who has a certain capabilities to, uh, to, uh, to set off a development into a cluster. This story <coughs> is uh, referred to in one of the articles in the paper collection. This young lady co uh, who, um, who uh, made the carpet for her own wedding, which during the uh, the time, during time, or over time, has resulted in a big cluster for production of carpets in, uh, in, uh, US, in the USA, in Dalton, Georgia. It was one person, and she had, of course, uh, also the capability to do business, to make business out of her, uh, her production. And I will come back to how a kind of historical coincidence can actually set off a self-reinforcing growth in, a, in an industry cluster. And then you have localization based on comparative advantages, where you have some types of resources present. And uh, this, is, this yields for the maritime cluster. It's this is kind of a combination between this uh, 
and this one person. And when you talk about uh, possible clusters in, in northern Norway connected to the oil and gas industry, it's uh, obviously uh, based on the, at the outset, the occurrence and existence of, uh, of natural resources. But one very important aspect of clusters is what we call the critical mass perspective. And when I, when I talk about critical mass, I'm talking about the minimum size of economic activity that this cluster must be able to, uh, to, uh, to do, or the minimal level of economic activity that should be present for these external effects between uh, agent in agents in this industry cluster to take place. So this, must, this system must be of a certain size for these interaction effects to take place between players. And this can be quite nicely illustrated in a, in a very simple analytical uh, scheme. Um, where we have one industry that is uh, that is a part or, or that is a part of this cluster, and then we have all the other industries in the economy. So it's a traditional two-sector model: the cluster, the cluster industry, and all other types of industries. And because of these external effects that I have mentioned here and which I mentioned uh, at the outset at the beginning of the lecture, we can assume that in the industry cluster the returns on invested capital increases because of these linkages and externalities, because of all these interaction between people and uh, support of, uh, of, uh, of increasing from the public sector, for instance, in, in increasing human capital and so on. So here the return on invested capital increases as a, as a matter of size, but at a diminishing rate. So when the cluster becomes very big, the, the increase in the rate of return is, is not, not that high. I'll show you in a graph how this works. But in the other industries, <coughs> where you don't have these interaction effects, the marginal utility of or productivity of uh, capital investments decreases. So the, um, there are two types of industries, one with increasing return on invested capital and another with a decreasing return on invested capital, with size. So what we, <coughs> what we then can, can, uh, can say here is that the distribution of capital between these two types of industries can be of such a, uh, a type that uh, distribution will be such that the marginal returns will be the same in the two industries. And the second one is that all capital will be used, in, be used in only one of the industries because the marginal returns there is higher than in the other industry. And this it'll, I think this will become clear when we turn to, to this slide here. This is <coughs> what we can call a, uh, economists call this a bathtub illustration. Because there, is, uh, <coughs> there are two vertical axes, one which gives the returns in the industry cluster and one that gives the returns in other industries. The length of the base, the, the horizontal axis, gives all the funds that are available for investments. 
in the economy, in this economy. So you could choose <coughs> along this line either to invest in the industry cluster in this direction or invest in other industries in this direction. So you need to be on somewhere on this line and that, that point where you end will, uh, will give you the distribution of investments between the in clustering industry and all other industries. This is a very stylized uh, picture, but I think it gives some, <coughs> some substance to the ideas of when we discuss this, uh, this critical mass problem, for instance. Because we can have here three possible equilibria. <coughs> We can have this one, where nothing is invested in a cluster. Zero, here. Uh, and then we can have a situation where we have the point B, where the returns on invested capital is equal between the industries. But we have a min, and this is the critical mass point, this is the minimum size of the industry cluster. And the idea now is that if you reach this point so that you have this amount of investment in the industry cluster, and if you are able to grow a little more, attract a little more capital, then you may end or you may be on this path where you see that the return on investments in the cluster as compared to all other industries, the difference is starting to increase because of these external effects, because of the interaction effects, which, which we assume that is not present in traditional industries. But in the cluster industry, the size, as the size increases, the interaction effect becomes stronger And because of the difference in return on invested capital, more capital is attracted to the cluster. So this is a kind of a self-sustaining growth path where, uh, where capital is transferred from traditional industries up to the industry cluster, up to this point, where you have again an equal return on invested capital between all other industries and the cluster. So beyond this point, so you will have some amount of investments in, 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 in other industries. But uh, as, at least as this graph is, is constructed, uh, most of the invested capital will be, will be attracted to the cluster. So, um, what we are often con um, concerned with in a small country like, uh, like Norway or in a, in, a, in a region anywhere in the world where the, cluster, where the clusters may be, let's say, on the smaller side, let's say that the cluster is, is not very far from this point B. And then if something happens that uh, one of the cornerstone players in this cluster say that, well, I'm not interested in expanding anymore here. I will, uh, would perhaps like to go abroad to another country and just set up uh, my business there instead. And I will withdraw from this region. What will happen then is that perhaps this cluster will then move be below the critical mass point. And then suddenly it may disappear and everything goes to the other industry of, of the invested capital. I can, uh, I can give you one example uh, which I mentioned to, to some of you, I guess. Um, 
In the 1980s, Norway had a quite strong industry of uh, cell phones in, in, uh, in the Oslo area. And then the, uh, and then the Finnish government, they, they started to, uh, to push money into a uh, former producer of uh, car tires and uh, rubber boots called Nokia. They get, got a lot of funds from the Finnish government. And uh, they suddenly were able to strengthen their uh, knowledge base for electronics. And some of the key personnel from Norway, they were attracted by this. And during a very short period of time, the Norwegian cluster for cell phone production was gone, moved to Finland. And now Microsoft in the US has bought Nokia, so they are also struggling. So, so this, uh, this may, may go on, but, but the point is that when you have a, a cluster uh, which is around this point B, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it is vulnerable. To, to changes that may be caused by external factors. And uh, one, <coughs> one thing that has worried people here in this region is the increasing level of uh, international ownership connected to some of the core industries in this, uh, in this local cluster. Will they stay? Or, or will they take all the knowledge and perhaps a good share of the people with them and move the production elsewhere? And if that happens to, I guess, not too many of the core companies in, in this local cluster, we may end up in a situation like this, where a lot of this this electromechanical industry may be, um, may be gone, may, may disappear. So, um, but again, if you manage to grow, you see the difference, and that may cause a cumulative self-reinforcing growth pattern to take place. And the idea is that the interaction, the external effects, are then increasing in importance because of the size and, and this, will, uh, this will grow up to the saturation point which is A. Best. Do you understand this? So if, uh, <coughs> if uh, I turn to this log 715 case, if Helgland v VNM VNM moves to Hammerfest or establishes themselves uh, uh, with a branch in, in Hammerfest, then perhaps that may, may be a contribution to, towards a point where this local industry in that region may become of such a size that things may start to develop very positively. Um, as one, one example. This is what I have... Uh, yep? Is the risk included in the previous one? Pardon? When it comes to risk. Risk? Uh, yes. Yeah? Is it included in the consideration of, uh, of uh, this? Yeah, <coughs> I, this, is, this, is very, this is a very schematic thing, but... I would say that if, we, if you really address the difference in return on invested capital, uh, which is the difference between these two lines, that should be based on an expected, uh, expected value of, of the return on invested capital, which then also should include risk, ideally. 
if you if you consider that. Uh, was that what you were, were thinking of, or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This this is the very hard part of establishing a cluster, and this this distance may be much much uh, it may be much longer, meaning that the need for capital may be much stronger as a share of the total uh, amount of capital, but to get from from this point and to this critical mass point. Is is the really the hard part of establishing a cluster, and that is why, when when uh, decision makers, politicians may say that well we should establish a cluster, then you need to do something, in s something similar to what they did in fin Finland, namely to really boost investments in this sector to be able to to reach this point B. Otherwise, you will, uh, you will not, you will not uh, get much out of it. And that is, of course, <coughs> a, uh, a movement that is uh, encumbered with, uh, with substantial risk. And that is perhaps where uh, the public sector should play a role to to uh, to uh, provide funds for for such a, such a movement, but at least in uh, in uh, in this country, the advice from the f from the expert advice is that one should be very careful with uh, providing public funding of uh, of specific industries to go from C to B because you never know which sector that can have the potential for, for becoming a cluster. Whereas other, <coughs> uh, other experts claim that, well, if you do your field work properly, and you try to, to really dig into where the potential is, one should not perhaps be too, too um, risk adverse as seen from the, uh, from the public sector's point of view, to invest in specific industries. But then you are, you, then you have to pay attention to some of the external conditions, namely, for instance, EU regulations. Because EU regulations, they, they actually ban supporting specific industries. So you cannot actually support, let's say, a telecom or uh, or whatever you have. But what you can do is to uh, support research and development programs. And you may design develop research and development programs that favors nanotech or uh, telecom or whatever. That is one way of doing it. And another way of doing it is to, uh, to uh, invest in transport infrastructure, which is open to everyone. It's as a non-discriminatory type of action that can be taken to sort of facilitate growth in an area. When uh, one of the Swedish car factories was facing problems uh, some 10 years ago, uh, it was called Saab. Some of you may know of that one. Uh, then. The Swedes, they really wanted to support Saab directly with the subsidies. And the EU said, no, no way, you are not allowed to do that. But what you can do <coughs> is that you can, you can build a four-lane highway from, uh, from this production plant and down to the port at Gothenburg to, to sort of uh, mitigate some problems with the, with the transport costs. But it ended up, I think, that uh, with the Chinese, I think they bought the whole thing. Uh, it's it's gone now. They have. There are some remains uh, in which uh, 
uh, I think some of the elements are, are still in production in, uh, in, in China, but, uh, but uh, the factory is gone, as far as I know. Okay. So this is, uh, this is uh, what I have more or less said. Um, we are focused a bit on this now, on the public investment activities. Uh, generic investments, non-discriminatory investments is, uh, is okay. Uh, to support, uh, to support uh, reduced transport costs. Uh, indirectly, the, the authorities can affect, let's say, localization decisions. They can decide that uh, the location of a uh, supply base for, for, for the oil and gas industry should be located at a specific point, like Kristiansund here, or further up north, and that may set off uh, a growth pattern, like I have described, at best. Then um, <coughs> we have some, let's say, we can develop this analytical scheme further by taking two countries into, into consideration. And then we are sort of discussing the the case of Norway and Finland, where you have a competition on where to locate the cluster. Uh, I will go quite quickly through that, because it's, uh, it's not a core of either uh, the transport course or the, or the logistics course, but it, it can still be of, of some interest. You have one cluster, and you have a competition between two countries on where to uh, where that cluster should end, sh should should end up. The returns on investment in the cluster is is considered as similar in in both countries. But you may you may assume that uh, they are facing a world market price for the products and uh, it's uh, it's not different. But the return on investment in other industries is lower abroad than home. So the return on, invest, uh, on investments in other industries in the competing country is lower than home. Meaning that the difference in the return on investing capital when you compare all other industries with the cluster industry is higher abroad than home. And then you should watch out <laughs> if, you are, if you are in a situation where you have a cluster that is sort of in the area around this unstable equilibrium B here, the critical mass point. Because this is the return on invested capital in the cluster, increases with size of the cluster, uh, size of, or the amount of invested capital. But <coughs> the return on the other industries abroad is lower than home in this, in, in, in a high-cost country. We can, we can consider this as a high-cost and a low-cost country, if you like. So what we see here is that the potential return on invested capital in the cluster abroad is somewhat higher, not very much higher. You see that the vertical distance between these points, two points, is, is quite small. But the big difference <coughs> Maybe down here, the level of the critical mass may be much lower in the, in the, in the foreign country. So, uh, so and, and you see also that the difference in the return on invested capital is, it's, I have, this is drawn very, let's say, the difference is illustrated as being very radical. In real life, it's not necessarily that radical. But, uh, but the point is that the cluster will, will end up in one of these uh, situations. It can only be located in one, one location. And, for, uh, <coughs> and if we 
consider some policy implications of being in this area, then it's, uh, it's uh, if you then gets below this critical mass point, you may not end here with the capital in all the other industries, but the cluster may simply be transferred to another country because the advantages is so much higher there. And that is exactly what happened <coughs> with this uh, Nokia cell phone case, Finland, Norway. But the Finns invested, and uh, then the whole thing started to, to move towards this, this point here. And then Microsoft came along a couple of years ago, but that is another story. I think it can be illustrated in, in the same way. Lots of knowledge, <coughs> already invested way be beyond this point B. It was easy for them to take over and, uh, and de further develop the, the cell phones that Nokia had initiated in the first place. Yeah, this is what I've said already. Uh, <coughs> new and established clusters. Every region wants them because of the nice uh, external effects and, and uh, the growth potential. But it is, uh, it's hard to start from scratch and build a cluster, as I have said. Um, small clusters may be vulnerable if, uh, if corn store actors disappear, as I've said. But the limits to what you can actually do about it is, is rooted uh, partly in, 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 in EU regulations that you cannot support the industry selectively. You have to do it indirectly through transport infrastructure or R&D funding or, or whatever. I'll show you <coughs> one, one other illustration on, uh, on this, uh, this internationalization thing which also makes sense if we think about it, how it works. But I think we should jump break before I start with that. So I will probably use a little more than two hours. Sorry about that. <laughs> we break now before we continue.